Silk Road was a website that allowed people to anonymously buy and sell drugs and other things that governments wanted to control or to tax. Ross Ulbricht has been found guilty of being the person who ran that website, and he is coming up to being sentenced. We've talked to his mother, Alex Jones, has interviewed her because there are many precedent-setting issues in this particular case in the digital realm. There is the issue of transfer of intent. He was just running a website. Was, did that make him a drug trafficker? There's also the issue of whether or not digital evidence can be used in a drug case, even though it can't be used in a banking case. And then, of course, there's also the issue of what constitutes possession of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. But there's also more mundane issues that we all come across all the time, and that is our violation of our Fourth Amendment. Although they find new ways to do this in the digital realm, these are issues that affect all of us. We've reported many times about the government's warrantless search using Stingray. And of course, everyone knows about the NSA and those warrantless searches. But also in this trial, there were issues of documents being dumped at the last minute so the defense could not see it, evidence being withheld from the defense that could have cleared Ross Ulbricht. And of course, a large part of that is the criminal investigation now into two of the agents that were lead investigators in the conviction. These agents have been charged with wire fraud, money laundering, and falsifying government documents. Do you think that if they're going to falsify government documents, that might have an effect on the fairness, on the justice of the trial? We're going to talk to Ross's mother, Lynn Ulbricht. She has put together a site, uh, freeross.org, and that's a place where you can get to know what these issues are, how they affect you, and also help them in their defense, because this is something that, as I said, is going to affect us all. There are large principles involved here. Joining us now is Lynn Ulbricht. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Ulbricht. I'm, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. I know this must be a very difficult time for you. Yeah, it's very, very challenging, but thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, of course, there's a lot that's on the line. Your son's uh, sentencing is coming up May 15th. Uh, it's possible that he could get up to life in prison with all the charges that they've added. And of course, I think it's important for people to understand there was a lot of talk about murder for hire and things like that, but they limited this strictly. If you look at the things that they uh, indicted him, charged him with, and found him guilty of, it all boils down to drug charges and then adding that, adding to that with conspiracy charges. But there's a lot of important precedents about this. I think as we see now, there was a lot of evidence that was not uh, allowed to be presented. The way they handed the evidence to the prosecutors was, I think, very egregious. It looks like they were trying to dump this on them at the last minute, and we can talk about that. But there's also important precedents that are being set in terms of websites and in terms of digital evidence, and I want you to speak to that briefly. Sure, and just let me make the point, um, yes, he was not charged for murder for hire. Yes. And I believe it's a smear tactic. But um, anyway, um, as far as precedent, there are several important things going into the digital age with this case. First of all, most of their evidence was digital. It is totally, you cannot authenticate digital evidence. You do not know who wrote a chat, email, screenshot. And actually, uh, the Supreme Court has thrown out cases uh, based on screenshots. Um, it's too easy to Photoshop it. Yeah. And, I mean, and of course, before we go any further, we need to, to point out that one of the things we're going to be talking about are these uh, federal uh, agents who have now been indicted and that was never allowed to come out during the trial. And it was one of those agents who was actually now involved in the murder for hire scam, uh, not your son. Yes, That's what the prosecutors are alleging. Yes, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Talk That's okay. Yes. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about because, um, yeah, so digital evidence. A mortgage company will not take a screenshot of a bank statement because they know how easily faked it is. This case, by accepting digital evidence, lowers the box standard for evidence dramatically and makes it a lot easier to put people in prison. Um, it's You cannot authenticate it. It's um, very easily faked, manipulated, edited. It's not reliable. And I think That's that really kind of highlights what I see with your this particular trial here. And that is that we, we've seen our government routinely ignore the uh, rules of evidence, routinely ignore the Constitution and what the law is in order to make their case, in order to get a conviction. And now we see that in the digital realm, they're even more cavalier about the way they do that. Let's talk about, uh, there's a couple of different issues that the attorney is bringing up to get a retrial. 
One of those is how they got the evidence about the servers. Tell us about that, because that involves them basically hacking into it. And from what I was able to see, it looks like initially the prosecutors tried to cover up what they did. They hacked into it without a warrant. And when they asked them, how did you find uh, this particular server, they, they lied about it. They said that it was a misconfiguration of the site's CAPTCHA uh, that had leaked the IP address. Nobody believed that that, uh, that technical explanation, and eventually they admitted, well, we just hacked the site, and then the judge said, well, that's okay. You didn't have a search warrant. We'll allow that evidence. I think they said, even if we did, I don't know if they, I don't know that they've actually admitted, they said, even if we did, it's okay. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. So, um, you know. <laughs> don't have to have but, a search um, warrant. Yeah. A and, um, and they put people in prison for hacking into. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. So, um, and it's also a question of an FBI agent lying under oath about how he found the server. And then you wonder what else are they lying about? I mean, he said how he found the server and experts all over the world said it was gibberish, a lie, inconsistent with reality. It did not compute. And, so, um, so they went yeah. into this and they didn't have a particular search warrant for this. They just basically hacked into okay. it. The judge says, that's okay, even though you don't have a search warrant, even though you hacked into it, you can use that. And when they got the physical evidence from your son, they did that with a general warrant. Explain to the audience why that's important. Well, in the Constitution, the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment specifies that a warrant must particularly describe what they are looking for. They can't just go in your house and rummage around on a fishing expedition to see what they can find. Um, by the way, that picture is the worst picture of Ross. <laughs> <laughs> that artist was not facing him and he doesn't look like that. Anyway, um, so um, we fought the Revolutionary War partly over this. Yeah. It's the basis of the Fourth Amendment. And um, so it's very fundamental and important. And they used the same kind of general warrant to um, search Ross's laptop, Gmail account, and Facebook. If they'd done it in his home, through his file cabinets and desk, it would be clearly unconstitutional. So for it's on his laptop, so it's not. I mean, this is a very important point going forward into the digital age because we keep more of our stuff on our computers and phones than we do in our file cabinets anymore. Absolutely. If they don't have to have a absolutely if they don't have to have a warrant, this affects everybody that has a cell phone. And we're seeing that now. They're using that with Stingray. They're going before the judges. In one case, they went before a judge, and the judge says, well, I need to see uh, your search warrant for obtaining this information. How did you get this information? Well, we can't tell you, judge, because we've signed a non-disclosure agreement. And he said, you don't have a non-disclosure agreement with me. Show me how you got this evidence. And they just dismissed the case and walked away. Rather than showing the judge, that's the kind of contempt that law enforcement has for the rule of law. It's why Barrett Brown, in terms of talking about how he was railroaded in his case, said we no longer have a rule of law. We have a rule by law enforcement. They can do whatever they wish. We need to understand just how dangerous this is, that they can suspend uh, the Fourth Amendment. They can do whatever they wish. You know, Lynn, when I look at this, we've talked about this before on InfoWars. They started, they broke the idea that you had to be found guilty before they could take your property, going all the way back to the RICO statute. And now we see how they're using civil asset forfeiture everywhere. They're doing the same thing with all of these different rights that we had that were specifically enumerated in the Bill of Rights. They've broken all of these basic freedoms that we fought so long and hard for that we have enjoyed as a in Western civilization for centuries. This is all rapidly disappearing before our eyes. I completely agree. And really, I see this case as much bigger than Ross or our family. I see it as, <coughs> excuse me, a, a really important, some really important points here that, um, you know, I'm given the opportunity to discuss because of my son. But I really believe that I, I totally agree with you. And to see it up close and personal like I have is very alarming. Um, you know, a prosecutor takes an ethical, I don't know if it's exactly an oath, but there's an ethical code of conduct that they're supposed to put the truth over a conviction. And yes. I don't see that that is being honored. Yes, exactly. Because the most important thing, this is why many people have said it's better to let uh, uh, one guilty person go free than to convict uh, uh, an innocent person, because we understand that once we give these kind of unlimited powers to the government, that is the most dangerous scenario. That's more dangerous than organized crime. That's more dangerous than terrorism, because we have given that kind of power to a government without any constraint. 
So we, we talked about now what they did in terms of getting the evidence, how they ignored the Fourth Amendment, how they got a general warrant. They didn't get a specific warrant when they got in physical information from him. They uh, hacked and uh, uh, lied about how they had, uh, had gotten that evidence. Then when they went to court, what they did with the defense was they essentially withheld information until the very last minute. It looks like they, uh, according to the lawyer, uh, your defense lawyer, they gave uh, 5,000 pages of material just prior to the hearing. Uh, ju oh. It's just a couple of weeks before the hearing, even though they'd had that information for 30 months in their possession, they withheld it until just two weeks before the hearing, and then they dumped all kinds of information on them during the hearing. That's true. Actually, it added up to 7,500 pages, and we figured out that's like reading the Obamacare bill more than three times <laughs> in less than 10 days. Wow. Um, so that was, yeah, there was many egregious um, things that happened in the trial. Um, one, you know, the, uh, we had witnesses blocked. They were not allowed to testify. Um, our attorney was hamstrung in how he could cross-examine. But one of the biggest things was the suppression of evidence, which has now come out with this corruption. And it was sealed. And what happened was, well, we can get into the corruption, but um, they did not want that introduced into the trial because, of course, it cast tremendous doubt on the investigation that there were corrupt agents involved at high levels of the Silk Road for two years. Yes, exactly. So, and before we get to those agents, in terms of the documents, what I saw reported was that they had uh, 145 new exhibits. Uh, they modified 50 to 100 others. And one example here, in the last week, within three days, they gave them 44 new exhibits. So they didn't give them time to take a look at the evidence. They, they grabbed information, grabbed evidence uh, illegally, unconstitutionally, and then they withheld evidence and suppressed evidence that could help the defense. Right. That's this, pretty much know, every bit of it. This kind of evidence in the trial, it, it's a moving target. It's impossible to wage an effective defense. Yes. This is complicated information. Yeah. Now, now one of the things that they withheld uh, that was in uh, some of this evidence was information about an alternative perpetrator. Now, one of the uh, things that they were coming forward with in the defense was, is it possible that he is being uh, used as a patsy. We've seen this happen over and over again by the FBI. Most of the terrorist attacks that come out, virtually all of them, as, as uh, Judge Napolitano and we have pointed out, virtually all of them either involve the uh, FBI organizing, equipping, and training the people, and then busting it at the last minute. Uh, typically, that's what's hap what happens with these uh, terrorist cases with a patsy. Now, in this particular case, we find that there's now two federal agents, one of them a DEA agent who uh, is alleged to have stolen $500,000 in Bitcoin, I believe. He was also the one that was alleged to have been involved in the murder for hire. Another one who was a Secret Service agent alleged to have stolen $800,000 in Bitcoin. Uh, they are now being uh, charged for wire fraud, money laundering, and falsifying government documents. But of course, that was not allowed to be talked about in your son's trial. The fact that the agents who were uh, leads in investigating him were involved in all of these different things, money laundering, falsifying government documents. Certainly that would have had an effect in the trial, I believe. I think it would have completely changed the trial. And I want to put a shout out to Alex because when I talked to him last July, he said, watch for law enforcement corruption in this case. Yes. And he turned out to be exactly right. Yes. Um, these guys, because they had an informant, they arrested an informant who gave them what um, Kashmir Hill of Fusion, she said it's like the digital keys to the kingdom. They had high level access to administrative functions on Silk Road. They had the ability to change the site. They had access to administrator platforms, administrator passwords, the ability to change PIN numbers, commandeer accounts. So when it comes down to evidence, they had the means to manipulate logs, chats, private messages, keys, posts, account information, and of course they would also have a motive to do that, to direct attention away from their own activities towards exactly. perhaps other people. It's been alleged so, that the Secret Service agent, Sean Bridges, uh, after getting the keys to the kingdom from this, uh, this person, he was able to transfer the bitcoins to himself, 800,000. He didn't come back to the meeting the next day. So he goes to a meeting, they show him how you could do this sort of thing. He disappears the next day, and so does the money. So do the Bitcoins. And as you're pointing out, if they can steal the money, they would certainly have motivation to change other things to uh, pass guilt on to someone else.
Sure. So at this point, how do you separate fact from fiction? You know, how do we know if there was tampering or fabrication? Are there more corrupt agents? There's a lot of information that's still unredacted. Uh, that's still redacted. The government's not usually very forthcoming with information. The attor our attorneys just found some new things out last week. So I, I think this is a tip of an iceberg. I think it very well could be. And um, I think it would have definitely had an impact on the trial. Um, the reason was we have to seal it because um, it will hurt the investigation if it comes out. So our, the, our attorney said, well, okay, let's just delay the trial. You're wrapping it up in the next couple months and then we'll have the trial. Exactly. And they said, yeah. And they said, no, because the people have a right to a speedy trial. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, you have a right to an better. honest trial, actually, I think, is, is uh, a, a just yeah. trial. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, use one right to preclude your due process rights. I mean. Well, I think it's factual. interesting uh, when the uh, judge, Judge Forrest, uh, issued the seal decision, she said that any information that be disclosed about the agents, the government agents alleged crimes would, listen to this, quote, result in significant prejudice to the integrity of the investigation. Do you think right. you think people might question the integrity of the investigation when these guys are stealing millions of dollars as they're investigating the crime? Uh, to me, that would be a slam dunk. Of course, if I was a juror, I wouldn't do anything to anyone who was anyone who had a website uh, that was engaged in commerce and they're not actually doing any selling. I also wouldn't send anybody to jail for life because there was drugs involved and, and drug selling because I don't believe in the uh, war on drugs. I think the prohibition has done nothing to stop drug use. All it has done is corrupt law enforcement as we see in this particular case and destroy our rights. I think this exactly is, is what's happening here is a microcosm of what we see in the war on drugs. Corruption of the government, destruction of our rights, and agents who basically can run wild. Well, it's, it's a complete, I mean, it hasn't stopped anyone from using drugs. No. But they keep doing it because it expands government power, as far as I can see. I mean, that's yes. the result of it. Yes. And makes a lot of money. And, you know, I go to the prison because I visit Ross, and I see the effect of this war on drugs on families. And it's horrible. It's tragic. And um, these are nonviolent people, you know, who are serving decades with these draconian sentences. And um, it's really a national disgrace. It's terrible. You know, I, and, and you point out nonviolent and, yeah, and the well, length of the well, sentences that, that he could possibly get a right. lifetime sentence. I just earlier in the uh, broadcast, I covered a shooting where it was it followed a high speed chase. And one of the officers, after all the shooting was finished, after they'd shot at the car about 150 times, one of the officers jumped on the top of the car and shot the two unarmed uh, occupants of the car 11 times in a fit of rage. Now, he's having charges brought against him, which we typically don't see in these police shootings, but the worst he could get would be 25 years. Yet your son, who did nothing to harm anyone, could go to jail for life if this stands. I, it's just an amazing injustice that we see in the war on drugs, and certainly the kind of roughshod practices that we see everywhere in the Justice Department, not just uh, about this uh, particular case, not just about war on drugs. We saw it in the Barrett Brown trial. We see it in every one of the trials, if we look closely, how they rig the system. I'm seeing it up close and personal, and I'm appalled. Well, I'm so, sorry. I'm so sorry about what's happening to your son. We'll uh, keep us posted as to what happens. We'll be watching this very carefully to see if the uh, crimes of these agents should call into question the integrity of the investigation. I think it very much should. Well, we're going to continue to watch to see what happens because it doesn't just affect your son's life and your family's life. It affects all of us and these rights that are on the line. Now, tell people how they can uh, follow this, how, how they can uh, contribute to his defense. Well, please go to freeross.org. Um, we are greatly in debt from the trial, which was very expensive, and now we need to fund the appeal to push back on these precedents that have been set and hoping, we, we were hoping to overturn. So, and also any other help, advice, networking, um, but certainly donations to the legal fund would be great. Um, it's, a, it's a huge Goliath of a foe we have here, and we're, it's just us. And um, so please help us. Absolutely, I, again, you have my sympathy. I think this is a great injustice, not only to you, but to America, that we can have this kind of a corrupt, system, a kind of corrupt law enforcement that is quite evident in this case. Thank you so much for joining us, Lynn Ulbricht.
Thank you, David. Well, that's it for tonight's news. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe there. Of course, if you want to get the information even more quickly every night as it occurs, please support us and subscribe to Prison Planet TV. Your subscription funds the operation, and of course, it can be shared with your friends. Up to 20 of them can watch it each night, Monday through Friday, as it's broadcast. Thank you for joining us. Join us tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Super Male has the key concentrated natural compounds that my body needed to go to the next level. Today is the day to take the InfoWarsLife.com challenge and to secure your bottle of Super Male or Super Female Vitality. Check them out today at InfoWarsLife.com or give our crew a call at 888 253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.